get right into it if you like. Okay. Um, how I how I begin the conversation is by asking how you would describe the state of the world today. Pretty bad. Um, well, it's very interesting. The uh, post-war uh, permanent set of arrangements uh, seems to be coming apart. Uh, and I guess it was bound to come apart once uh, communism failed. But we don't have a set of arrangements. We thought that the common market was a permanent fixture, and we thought the United States was governed by a permanent ruling class, and all of that's coming apart. But I, I mean, is this the kind of state of the world you're interested in? Because philosophically, it's a different state of the world. I'm, I'm speaking philosophically. I was going to bring consciousness into it. Okay. If we're talking about the state of the world in philosophy, then I think it's a kind of an interesting time because there is no dominant uh, philosophical genius. There's nobody on the uh, there's no equivalent of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein or even Martin Heidegger. There's nobody out there who is a, uh, a dominant figure, and it's kind of interesting to see all the stuff that goes on. Now, I think there is a single overriding question in philosophy, but not, most philosophers wouldn't agree with me, and that is how do we square our conception of the human reality with what we know about how the world works. We know the world is described by physics and chemistry, but the world described by physics and chemistry is mindless and meaningless. And yet we think we have a, a human world of consciousness, intentionality, language, ethics, aesthetics. How do those fit together? And I've been working on that now in effect for 50 years on different aspects of that problem. There are a lot of different parts to it. But anyway, that's to me the most interesting question in philosophy. Well, does our level of, doesn't our level of consciousness as a species and as individuals reflect our perception of the world? Well, I think the biological function of consciousness is to enable to cope with the world. So we couldn't be too far off from the actual world or we'd die. Uh, but we, if we're able to cope with the world, we must have some degree of adequacy of our consciousness and its relation to the world. And I think that's obviously the case. I mean, we're able to cope with the world. We are able to move around. Now, of course, at the big and small level, we're, we are hopelessly inadequate. If we, if we all had the size, if each human being had the size of, a, of an electron, well, we'd have a different conception of the world. Or if we each had the size of a galaxy, we'd have a different conception. So we have a sort of middle-sized uh, uh, people, and our conception of the world is really designed for middle-sized objects. So when we find out about the structure of the hydrogen atom or about the nature of the 100 billion galaxies, uh, well, then we have to have a different uh, conception. But basically, we're not doing too badly. A lot of, many things we don't understand, particularly we don't understand how the brain creates consciousness, but we do understand quite a lot about how the world works. So maybe, maybe you wouldn't mind defining what consciousness is. You're, you're saying that, that consciousness is, is a result of a physical... Um, manifestation of physicality? There's a physical manifestation. It just happens to have this odd feature of subjectivity. But let's define it. Consciousness consists of all those states of feeling or sentience or awareness. Uh, it begins when you wake up in the morning uh, and it goes on all day until you go to sleep or become unconscious. And on this account, dreams are a form of consciousness. So for every conscious state, the essential thing is uh, it's what it feels like. There's something that it feels like because every conscious state has this qualitative character. That's consciousness. Now, how does it fit in the world? Well, it's a biological phenomenon created by brain processes, and it exists in the brain. Uh, and as such, of course, it's a physical property like any other, but it's different from other physical properties uh, in that it has this ontological subjectivity. It only really exists as consciousness when you're aware of it. And, and so, so, so how do you account for the, the split in consciousness that every human experiences, whether it's e emotional, uh, mental, you can have different, different, yeah. different aspects of, of, of awareness happening all at the same time. Well, uh, you have a remarkable capacity in the brain. Uh, it is stunning. In fact, a con the brain takes all of our different inputs, it creates a conscious field, and then we have a single unified conscious field in which everything comes together at once, and that's what makes it so powerful. So right now, I don't just see you, but I feel the shirts against my back, and I can look outside, and I feel the weight of my body against the chair, and I feel the sound of my voice. 
All of that, and this is an amazing thing, is part of a single unified conscious field. Kant was aware of this. He saw that that was crucial for consciousness. So that unified conscious, consciousness field, does that include intuition? And, um, um... It, includes everything. it includes absolutely all of your conscious states, whether it's enjoying Beethoven or feeling the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism. Whatever your favorite conscious state, it's all part of the conscious field. Yeah. And and, and you can have them all together at once. That's what I like about it. I can be reading a book, thinking about my income tax, and listening to music, all going on at once. And is it possible to make other connections with other beings on the planet through that field? Well, of course. I mean, that's what, that's what you and I are now doing. Humans have this amazing capacity, language. But animals, I mean, my dog Tarski and I communicate a lot. He doesn't have a language. Uh, but he kind of understands what, what I'm thinking, and I understand what he's thinking. So you have different degrees of communication. Now, language gives us an incredibly powerful device, a human language for communication. And of course, that's why our communication is different from animals. No animal can have the kind of conversation you and I are now having. <clears throat> so where does, it seems that we are, are, are a conflicted being. Uh, yeah. Where does that conflict, would you say that conflict comes from? Well, I don't know what, which conflict you're talking about. I think uh, there are a lot of conflicts that people have. Uh, they have conflicts with other people. They're constantly engaged in competition and various forms of disagreement. And, of course, they have various conflicts in their own life. In the end, if you're a human being, you become acutely aware of the fact that your life is finite. You're going to die someday. So there are all these conflicts, but there's not a single conflict. There's a whole bunch of them, and not all of them involve uh, different people. Some conflicts are within a single self. Right. Well, would you say that most people are, are conflicted within themselves? No, most people are very directed toward other people. They're terribly worried about what other people think of them and are they succeeding and do other people approve of them and are they wearing the sort of clothes that other people want them to wear. All people are very much obsessed with other people's opinions of them. How much free will does a person have? I mean, there's obviously yeah. levels of consciousness, wouldn't you say? Yeah, well, it's a conscious uh, free will where I can raise my right arm or my left arm or I can read a book or scratch my head or drink a beer. Uh, and then, of course, there's some things I don't have free will. I can't decide uh, that I'm going to digest something. It's up to my uh, stomach. I don't have the free will where digestion is concerned. But, of course, the whole thing could be an illusion. We have the experience of free will, but it could be that everything's determined that this is a massive trick that evolution has played on us. It gives us the conviction of free will, but that doesn't prove, we can't avoid the conviction of free will, but that doesn't prove it's true. We might be mistaken. So what about within yourself? You, you must have spent a lifetime examining your consciousness. Do you see that, that, that your consciousness has evolved over your lifetime? Well, certainly. Uh, it's evolved, and as I get older, it's degenerated. I'm much uh, less quick, and a lot of things I can't remember that I could remember before. Uh, so uh, you do have <laughs> evolution. It's never a fixed, <coughs> fixed field in a way that Descartes tried to describe it. Uh, there's a, it's a biological phenomenon, and like all other biological phenomena, it evolves. You get better as you get older up to a point, and then you start to decline. And uh, you and I are both in a state of decline. I'm much further along than you, but you'll get, you'll catch up. <laughs> well, thanks for that cheery uh, thought. <laughs> yeah. How do you, how do you deal with aging? Uh, well, it beats the alternative. Uh, so I hope to keep on living indefinitely. But uh, still, I, I'm not as good a skier as I was a mere 50 years ago. And what are your thoughts about um, consciousness after the point of? physical death. Is that when consciousness is gone? Well, it's, it's conceivable that consciousness could exist after death, but it's very unlikely. I mean, uh, all consciousness, all known consciousness is in human and animal brains. And when the brains go, the consciousness goes. Uh, maybe we can create consciousness as an artificial medium. Nobody's done it yet. We have no idea how the brain does it, so we don't know how to do it artificially. But the chances that we're going to have consciousness that survives the destruction of our body are, are virtually uh, zero. I mean, it's about like saying, well, after my body's destroyed, will I be able to enjoy drinking beer and eating hamburgers? Well, you can kind of imagine, but it's not going to happen. It's just that's in order to uh, drink beer and eat hamburgers, you got to have a body. Similarly, in order to be conscious, you got to have a body, and and without you got to have a brain, and without it, no consciousness.
So phenomena like deja vu or coincidence, that kind of thing, uh, how, do you, how do you relate that to, to uh, the conscious, the field of consciousness? How do I rate coincidences and stuff like that? Deja vu, coincidences, those, those kind of um, uh, phenomena. Well, okay. Look, the fact is, in your life, you're going to have a couple of billion conscious states, and there are going to be all sorts of oddball combinations. You know, suddenly it, come back, it comes back to me, uh, the phone number <coughs> of my good friend in first grade. Well, okay, so the brain produced an oddball uh, coincidence of my present conscious state in Berkeley, California, and my consciousness of Denver, Colorado, ah, years ago. So that, these sorts of things happen. But it's not, it's nothing miraculous about it. People think, well, if there's some weird uh, configuration of conscious states, it must prove some uh, crazy thing. It doesn't. It's just random recombination of two billion conscious states is going to give you some odd coincidences. <clears throat> and do, do you think there's a genetic uh, memory that is passed on well, it's not quite the right to describe it as memory, but there's no question that there's a genetic basis for cognition, which involves uh, certain uh, capacities which are innate. And those are innate capacities, such as the capacity to acquire language, the capacity to see things, capacity to move around. All of those are innate, and in a sense, they're like memory, because you uh, you have them uh, for, from things that have happened in the past. Now, one of the most spectacular of these is your capacity to learn a language, your capacity to acquire and use language, and that, again, has to be built into the brain. Uh, my dog, as I've pointed out to you, is very intelligent, but he just can't do it. He cannot have the kind of language that you and I are having, and that's because he, he lacks the innate mechanisms. He lacks, he lacks the kind of brain that would enable him to learn and use a language. And how do you relate identity? Identity to consciousness, because they seem to be two separate, two separate entities that, that reside within our, our ability to. Big mistake to think they're entities. Consciousness is a feature of the brain, the way liquidity is a feature of water. Now, the mistake is to think, well, then there are two things going on in the brain, uh, the mental and the physical, the consciousness and the whatever. All that's a mistake. Look, I raised my arm. Now, when I raised my arm, I had a conscious experience of raising my arm. But of course, it wouldn't go up <laughs> if I didn't have a whole lot of neurobiological processes, specifically if I didn't secrete acetylcholine at the axon end plates of the motor neurons. So the temptation is to think, well, then there are two events. One is the secretion of acetylcholine, and the other is me raising my arm. There are not. There's exactly one event, and it has different levels of description. The proof that it's one event is that you can't have one without the other. You can't have this conscious experience without the neurobiology, and you can't have this neurobiology without this conscious experience. So one of the dumbest mistakes in our philosophical tradition is to suppose that consciousness is not an ordinary part of the physical world. It is a part of the physical world. You can't have this experience without the secretion of acetylcholine. But, of course, to describe it at a conscious experience is to describe it at a different level. It's like my car engine. There's a description of the car engine in terms of the oxidization of individual hydrocarbon molecules when the engine's running. And then there's a description of the engine running. They, they uh, Burning of the gasoline uh, 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 creates power to drive the piston. Those are not two different events. That's one event, two different levels of description. And somebody raised my arm. There are two descriptions of one event, the conscious experience and the secretion of acetylcholine. But it's one single event. And it's a mistake to think, well, is it mental or physical? Is it biological and so on? Of course, it's obviously biological, but it's, it's different from us, uh, many other biological processes because it's got this feature of ontological subjectivity. But if we didn't have these stupid traditions of God, the soul, and immortality and scientific materialism, we'd see that what I've told you, just it's just common sense. It's what we know from the past couple of hundred years of scientific investigation. Consciousness is a biological phenomenon created by and realized in the brain. And what about the, the initial event, which is the idea? Well, there are different ideas and different ways of getting them. One way to get an idea is to look at something out there in the world. Here's a book, and I get ideas by reading a book. But a lot of my ideas are innately built into me. I mean, how to move about. I, I have mechanisms that enable me to 
trigger the pre-existing capacity in my body to walk, but it has to be there uh, already. So I have some innate mechanisms like my capacity to walk and move about, and then I have all sorts of acquired knowledge, uh, such as what I get from reading a book. So then would you say it's an innate, an innate, it's innate for somebody to look at the world spiritually or, or logically or well, scientifically? Well, if you can look at the world, you must be able to look at it. And those abilities have got to be acquired on the basis of innate capacities. But all of these traditional vocabulary, well, is it spiritual or is it material? I think all that's just massive confusion. Uh, if we didn't have these nutty histories, we would never think in those categories. Just think about what it's like to be a human being in the real world. And you see, yes, you have conscious states, and, uh, and those are grounded in and caused by and realized in the neurobiology, and they enable you to cope. They enable you to move around and manage things in the world. So then what is the base for your understanding? Logic, would you say? Well, logic is the base by which I organize the elements of my understanding, but pure logic doesn't give you any knowledge of the world. It just enables you to organize the knowledge you've already got. Right. See, I think that, uh, bar, uh, that uh, uh, Donald Trump is president, uh, and that entails logically that there is a guy who's president. Uh, but I, the logic itself doesn't give me the fact that Donald Trump is president. I have to have some kind of information in order to get that. <clears throat> would, would you say that men and women approach consciousness uh, differently in any way? Well, sure, at uh, rather superficial levels. But at a basic level, the ability to see the color red, the ability to move around, the ability to move your arms, men and women are the same. Uh, they have differences at very high levels, differences in relating to each other and differences in, in how they organize their thoughts. But basically, uh, uh, humanities have pretty much got the same mechanisms for consciousness. Are you familiar with the work of Carlos Castaneda? You must be from um, the... Well, I just at a kind of uh, a joke level, you know. I mean, he was a sort of pop figure of the 1960s. Um, but I don't remember what happened to him or if he's still around or if anybody cares about it anymore. Well, from, from, it's just that from, the, from certain traditions, shamanistic traditions, Native American traditions, they say yeah. consciousness can be evolved into a whole different level of awareness that is inorganic. Yeah. You've never explored those oh, kinds of... Yeah. Um... Yeah, in order to have consciousness, you've got to have a brain. In order to have a functioning brain, you've got to have certain organic processes. So then, so then it's mostly a science. It's a science-based... Well, we don't know the science, but we know that when we find out about how consciousness works, it'll be a scientific result, yes. No amount of just sitting here and reflecting will enable me to understand the role of the... Uh, neurotransmitters in the uh, creation of consciousness. I mean, that's a factual question. Scientific investigators are going to take it. Why, why does serotonin ha have a certain number of carbon rings and dopamine has a different number of carbon rings? In order to answer questions like that, you got to uh, do some sort of factual investigation. It's misleading to call it science because that suggests there's this separate realm of science. There isn't. Science is a set of techniques we've evolved for finding out how the world works. But it definitely has its, its limitations of what it says is possible. Is that true? No. You, I mean, science doesn't tell you in advance what's possible. You have to find out what's possible. Who the hell knows what's possible? I mean, uh, one of the things, the reason that quantum mechanics is such a pain in the ass is we don't see how quantum results are possible. But we know they're there. We've had 50 years now of experiments, and they always come out. Right, right. <clears throat> right. No, so you can't know in advance what's possible. So, so techniques such as meditation, people who practice meditation, yeah. they seem to put themselves into different uh, states yeah. of, of awareness. What's your, what's your understanding of that? Well, my understanding is if you mess around with the brain, you get interesting results. Right. Uh, some people get odd results just by drinking a lot of wine. Others take uh, different kinds of chemicals, and some people just reflect. They do meditation. Fine. More power to them. Good luck. I have no objection to any of that. You've never explored it? No, I mean, I don't have the patience for meditation. I'd, I'd get too nervous. But I have explored beer and wine. I've had them. And they do alter your consciousness, but I don't think they improve your intelligence. It seems like you're more intelligent on the spot, but later on you realize you weren't. <laughs> so you don't think there's a higher intelligence? There's a universal design of some kind? No. I mean, as far as we know, uh, the kind of intelligence that we have 
as human beings is about as far as you're going to get on this earth. Now, uh, there are lots of other planets and lots of other solar systems and lots of other galaxies. And maybe there are forms of consciousness by agents, by agents that have much bigger and better brains than ours. But as far as we know on, on uh, this earth, the, the best consciousness, and the most advanced consciousness is in humans. Uh, maybe in some other uh, planet or some other system, there are people who are beyond humans. But right around here, we're about the best we got. My, as I said, I love my dog. But he, he can't do philosophy. He can't do uh, mathematics. And similarly with other animals known to me. That's just a fact. I mean, if it turns out that the chimpanzees are better than we are at higher mathematics, well, more power to them. Welcome to the club. But right now, it turns out that if you want higher mathematics, you don't ask a chimpanzee. You ask a mathematician. <clears throat> what about something like a dolphin? You, 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 you mentioned, you mentioned the, 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 ape, the ape way, which is the human way, yeah. maybe, perhaps, in turning their, 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 their view into something like mathematics. But maybe yeah. another species would have no interest in, in, in manifesting something in that realm. Yeah. yeah, who knows? Dolphins have big brains. They don't seem right. to have the kind of complications that our brains have. But who knows? Maybe they're smarter than we are. It's just that we, don't, we haven't found a way to communicate them with very efficiently yet. You know, this is a factual question. As far as we know, we're the smartest animal. But I, if somebody else is smarter, well, welcome to the club. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> so what drove you to philosophy? What? What drove you to, to, to make your focus? Well, you know, I, I, it, I, I've always been a philosopher. All these questions were, interest me. They're, they're fascinating. I think they're the most fascinating questions. I, I didn't choose to be a philosopher. I was born a philosopher. And I always assume everybody else is too, but maybe not. Maybe some people aren't interested in this kind of stuff. Well, everybody's a philosopher in their own ways. Isn't just religion just a philosophy? No, I think that's right. I think anybody who thinks at all has to think philosophically, whether they like it or not. And it's just some of us have to try to... I try to do a good job of it. So what was the last thing that, that blew your mind, that actually changed your way of seeing something? Oh, well, I mean, this happens every day when I, uh, I read the newspapers. I mean, uh, the Warriors finally I, I beat Cleveland in, in the championship in basketball. That blew my mind. I mean, because last year the, uh, Cleveland beat them. So the, everything's mind-blowing if you look at it in a certain way. I go out and look at my grass growing, and I think all kinds of things. One thing, I think, my God, I need to mow the lawn. But I also think it's absolutely amazing how mitosis produces grass leaves and how they know how to grow. So there are so many mind-blowing things. The world, this is one well, of the market philosopher is a philosopher is astounded by what any sane person takes for granted. And does a philosopher also have to be careful that they are, are not rigid in their... In their yeah, in their... you have to be kind of open to all kinds of things happening. See, I mean, I sort of miss a simple Newtonian world, but the world isn't that way. You know, the world is much more complicated and much more inconsistent than Newtonian mechanics led us to believe. Newtonian mechanics is a special case. But the more general case involves all kinds of weird stuff in, in quantum mechanics and in uh, relativity theory, which you don't get in Newtonian mechanics. So do you find, you're, you're mentioning there's no great, great philosophers in, in this age, but do you find that young minds are taking possibility ever further? Well, I always hope the younger generation will be a lot smarter than we are, but I haven't seen it yet. Uh, the stuff that's coming out of younger philosophers, I think, is pretty second rate. But, you know, I, I don't read all that much, so maybe there's some better work that I know about. I think the problem is we tend to absorb the mistakes of our grandparents, and they're hard to shake off, like the mistaken idea that there is a mental and there's a physical, and, and there's a problem with how the mental relates to the physical. All that's a load of bullshit. I mean, I think there's a world we live in, and you have to try and figure out how it works. So is that, is that, is that all this is really then? It's just a, 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 we're thrown into, we're in, we're in circumstance, and, and with our brains, we just find our way through circumstance? Exactly. We find our way through various circumstances, and lucky for us, evolution gave us a brain uh, that was originally evolved for very simple hunter-gatherer communities, but we got extra neurons, so we can do things that uh, hunter-gatherer people mostly can't do, like fly airplanes and work on uh, computers and write novels. So how is it that it seems like it's, it's been a quickening in the last uh, few thousand years? Yeah. 
How else was it in the last 2,000 years? There's been a quickening of... of, of well, yeah, there has. Well, the problem is that once you get an advance, then you build on the advance, so you get a kind of... Uh, uh, I, 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 you get a multiple progression. Uh, you get a multiplier effect. So if you know twice as much, then it's easy to learn twice as much or twice as much, and the knowledge grows a whole lot faster. That's what's happening. And it seems like it has to be a collective for adult work because no single person can make anything anymore. No, no, you got to have cooperation now. You can't really do uh, advanced scientific work without cooperating. Now, in philosophy, I think you can because the problems are much dumber and we're still in a very primitive stage. However, maybe in my philosophy, it would be better if I cooperated more with other philosophers. It's just I always get hung up with them because they make what I think are obvious mistakes. <laughs> so there's been no, you've had no philosophical, um, mind, mind bending. Oh, well, I sure, I was taught by great philosophers and it made a big difference. I was taught by John Austin and Peter Strawson and they were just terrific teachers and they taught me how to do the subject. So I haven't, uh, uh, I, I have certainly benefited from other people. I haven't done it all by myself, not at all. And what were significant ideas that you heard that, that shifted the way you saw the world, the way that you thought? Well, one significant idea was that you'd better take language seriously when you think about human thought and how thought relates to reality. You can't just take language for granted. You've got to ask yourself, how does it work? How is it possible I make these noises through my mouth and I succeed in communicating? You and I can communicate on the basis of that. That's the kind of thing that you learn if you're going to be a philosopher is you don't take anything for granted. You are astounded by what looks kind of obvious to ordinary people. And I guess each each language has its built-in bias. Well, yeah, it, it isn't so much the bias, but there's a certain there's certain structural features. Now, human languages tend to have uh, all uh, certain structural features in common, and that's not an accident. All languages have sentences. Uh, why? What's the big deal about the sentence? Well, uh, if you answer that question, you've told us a lot about the nature of language. It's the sentence and not the word that does the work. The word just contributes to the meaning of the sentence. So if you understand that, why is a sentence primary, then you're off and running to understanding language. Now I think in, to understand language you have to see it as an extension of the more basic biological capacity of the human mind to cope with the world. Language is an extension of that and it gives it much greater power. But let's always remember we're talking about human consciousness, human con biological consciousness, and that's the foundation of language. Well, we've covered a, quite a quite a variety. Okay. Here. Yeah, a good start. That was fun talking to you. <laughs> so let me just a couple more. Um, uh, so how much control do we actually have over our consciousness? Would you say? I mean, the well, I have almost no control over mine. I mean, there are these Buddhists who say they have complete control over their consciousness. They can make themselves want something or make themselves not feel hungry. I my mind's just a mess. I I I don't have any control of my consciousness. I can't even. I, I, I don't I, I can't even organize my daily work but that's up to, it varies a lot from individual to individual some people are good at organizing and controlling their consciousness other people like me are hopeless so you say you wouldn't say that you're a disciplined person oh I'm hopelessly undisciplined I'm the most undisciplined person I know absolutely very poor self-discipline but you seem to be able to trust something and let your words fly well, because I, I, people keep saying things that provoke me or they say things I disagree with, so words often come out. But sometimes when I talk, I'm amazed to hear what I say. <laughs> what was the last amazing thing you heard yourself say? Well, like just now, for example, I said I was amazed about the things that I say. I hadn't been thinking about that. Yeah, but it's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So one last thing, and it, it's kind of a... It, it, it's kind of a, a hokey thing, but I still uh, ask everybody this: if if you could make a message to humanity, yeah, um, what would you say to people? Well, I, I about one thing, I think you shouldn't try to summarize everything in a single message. The problem with uh, doing that is um, is that you um, you tend to give the impression that this is somehow more important than other things that can be said. You tend to give the impression that, some, that the things are more simple than they really are. But if there's one message that I would have for humanity is that is 
don't take your present obsessions too seriously. If there's one thing that is obvious to anybody as you get older, is the utter futility of most and maybe all human endeavor. Uh, so do the best you can. We're all going to die sooner rather than later. And in the end, a lot of things you think are desperately important are not a lot important. Well, the depressing was... message, but that's my message. Actually, there was two messages. Because the first yeah. message was that messages are, are deceiving. So that was great. Okay. Good. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Okay. Yeah, and we'll talk again. Yeah, thanks a lot. better. Yeah. Bye. Okay, take care. Thank you.